Welcome to the FinTech One-on-One Podcast, episode number 401. This is your host, Peter Renton, chairman and co-founder of FinTech Nexus. Before we get started, I want to talk about our flagship event, FinTech Nexus USA, happening in New York City on May 10th and 11th. The world of finance continues to change at a rapid pace, but we will be separating the wheat from the chaff, covering only the most important topics for you over two action-packed days. More than 10,000 one-on-one meetings will take place, and the biggest names in fintech will be on our keynote stage. You know you need to be there, so go ahead and register at fintechnexus.com and use the discount code PODCAST for 15% off. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Eitan Ben Susan. He is the CEO and founder of North One. Now, North One, uh, all about small business. To describe this as really a small business bank account is not doing it justice because what they've done is really they have rethought about the entire relationship that a small business owner has with financial products, with their their entire financial business life. And they've reimagined it to make it much better than what uh, traditional offerings are. And really, you know, they've differentiated themselves in doing a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to helping a small business owner manage their finances better. They've thought deeply about this. They have they have a lot of um, connectivity, which we'll talk about in some depth. And you know, we also talk about what is it that actually small business owners want in a bank account. You know, we also talk about the the typical market that did North One is is focused on. We talk about open banking and how this is a key piece of what they're trying to do here. And you know, we talk about fundraising in a difficult environment and much more. It was a fascinating discussion. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Aitan. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So let's get going by giving the listeners just a little bit of background about yourself. And, you know, you've had an interesting career to date. Why don't you give us some of the highlights? It actually, it starts with my childhood. Okay. I grew up in a family of small business owners. And many of my families were professionals who would commercialize their trade and create a small business out of it. And growing up, I saw the way the business ran the family as opposed to the family running the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just a way of life, but it was it was so universal. Aunts, uncles, grandparents, you know, the finance department was on the dinner table at night. It dictated your vacation, your, your weekends, whatever it was. Later in life, you know, I, I ended up working at McKinsey for um, five or six years and was at this moment in time when there was a lot of buzz coming out of Europe, specifically around this wave of new financial technology that was opening up new forms of manufacturing and delivery of financial services. And so um, in many ways, I was kind of tasked with studying what was emerging there and kind of playing it out for the North American market. And I spent some time watching, you know, the London scene, Paris, Berlin, Tel Aviv, all these different places, seeing this kind of explosion of of fintech innovation. Now we call it fintech, I don't think they did then. And and to me, it was like the writing on the wall. Like I just, I saw what was happening there and I was just so convinced that this was the future. It boiled over time to the point where I just, I quit the job. I said, look, this is like, I'm, I'm so excited by what this has. I have to be a part of it. I have to build it. I don't want to advise anymore around it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, went out, interviewed about a hundred small business owners across North America to kind of reacquaint myself with that problem set. And, and to my surprise, the problem had not gone away. Right. You know, 30 odd years later, the problem had moved from paper to desktop. And of course, Mm -hmm. there were many new software services like accounting software and expense software, which had helped with point solutions. But the raw problem was that there was a analog bank account sitting at the center of the financial ecosystem for a small business owner. And it was not in play well with anybody. (laughs) It wasn't meant to, to do very much. And that pain of removing information from there and turning it into what a finance department need was the greatest source of pain and error and failure for most of these small businesses. And, and hence, this is the, the kernel behind what ultimately North One does. Did you went, go and interview these small business owners with the idea that you were going to start this business or did it sort of naturally kind of come out of those conversations? 
<laughs> that was definitely not my intent. I, I, <laughs> I, I thought that was the most ludicrous idea of them all. I, I thought there would have been, you know, a data science play, maybe kind of some sort of software service layer. It didn't even strike me that neobanking was actually where this ends up. I just thought the inspiration came from seeing what was going on in Europe and it would lead me to some interesting solution. But then over the course of time, it dawned upon me that intellectually honest answer to what I was hearing was that people didn't need a new or better accounting software. They had great stuff and people didn't need X, Y, and Z. What they actually needed was a bank account that could empower them all, that could actually plug all this different data together around you know, the transaction ledger and get these businesses to stop having to take screenshots and, and kind of have context-free transactions. They don't know who did it. The string is illegible. They can't figure out where it's from. All this stuff was, was kind of creating compounding error. And so at the end of it, I said, I guess if I was really serious about solving this problem that I was seeing, it felt like the arrow straight through the heart of it was through you know a, a banking, a business banking offering designed specifically to be the foundation of a finance department in a small business, mm-hmm. as opposed to kind of jamming it onto the side and trying to put a host, a, an ecosystem of, of services and tools around it. You're Canadian, right? Was the idea always this is a this is a universal problem? It's not just for the Canadian market; it's for the U.S. market. Candidly, I'm, I'm definitely Canadian. I knew the American market better than any because that's the one I'd always been. You know, the clients that I had at McKinsey were you know focused on that market, okay. so I knew the market very well. And it was always, I mean, it is a universal problem, which was the beauty of it that you solve this well, you can solve it in many places. And we've seen folks like Revolut take that, you know, that same process of finding many countries where the same you know need existed and so you know we, we always wanted to serve the greatest impact for our efforts and so the american market was obviously one the one that you know we saw the rawest problem and the timing was just right there where we could actually find a port of call and actually launch and that's like you know incredible it was the right time right place right so so when did you launch the business and when did you launch in the u.s was full time on this, you know, as early as 2016, even right. Just, but this was you know wandering the desert. Like I was <laughs> bumping my way through many very awkward conversations, trying to figure out how to solve this problem elegantly for small businesses. But in earnest, the first folks to use the service across America was in the summer of 2019. Okay, it was a long planning phase. I was fortunate; I had the right time of life. You know, I had just that moment when you can actually take your time with something, and, and it paid off because. We really got to know this problem, not only just from a technical point of view, but from almost like anthropologically, just spending days with business owners, watching them, seeing every single thing they do, look at their like body language. Are they sweating when they open their bank account? Like, what's the point of stress, et cetera? We've got to do so much of that so that we were ready to go. We had a really good understanding of how this, you know, this kind of an offering would be used and, and what problems it was solving, step one, step two, and you know, all the way to the end of it. So then uh, how do you describe your target market? Is it any small business? I mean, how small and how big? The customers that we we really thrive with are businesses, of, let's say one to 10 employees, typically, you know, larger than like a gig economy side business. You know, you, you have a kind of a weekend hobby or et cetera. And it's definitely smaller than a mid-market or enterprise company, which is making you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. These are companies that are the way I best describe it, if you walk on your way to work, those are our customers that you're seeing in the street. Mm-hmm. And they are typically, the reason that that's the case is that the, the person suffering the most is typically the business owner. They're the one who truly doesn't really have a finance department supporting them, but maybe they have a bookkeeper or an accountant, but that never takes away the pain. They're also the people most motivated to find a solution and they actually can make the decision. So that's that person is the one that we serve. And so they, you know, those businesses, we understand that pain really, really well. You've said you've had lots of conversations here. What is it that they actually want from a bank account? There's two parts of that answer. There's kind of the in-your-face answer, and then there's the, you know, I guess what I call like the magical answer. So the in-your-face one was these business owners said, like, just, I need these banks to get out of my face. Like, get them out of my hair. Like, why am I wasting time in my day to stand in line at a branch to deposit a check to authorize a wire? They get me on hold in the middle of my workday. You know, the list, you know, the drill of all those different things. They just said, like, this is crazy especially for business owners in rural communities who said, you know, they've shut down the branches here. And so I'm traveling an hour every direction to deposit like a thousand dollars of checks. Like it's crazy. Like it just, it's terrible for my business. And so there was this visceral problem they were looking to solve. And so us, you know, being able to say, you can get all of your operational banking done right from your pocket or your, or your computer. 
um, without sacrificing, right? So we, we have wires and ACH, but we also have the ability to deposit checks, but to write checks. So we have the ability where you can have a check printed and mailed on your behalf. We have a uh, opportunity for our customers to make cash deposits. In classic neobank thinking, you, you very often people will say, well, what if we just assume all money moves online? Doesn't it simplify <laughs> what we're trying to build here? But knowing these customers, you know, 30 something percent of the revenues comes in the form of cash. And right. so our customers can go to a Walmart, a 7-Eleven, an Office Max, and go to the cashier and deposit cash in their account. And so all of a sudden, we were starting to kind of come to them and say, you don't actually have to sacrifice the way you do business to get on with this wave of digitization and banking that you're seeing. You can actually do it all today. And that was a very important uh, moment for them. Because for most of these businesses, when you talk to them, they felt left out. They're like, well, my business isn't completely online. And what about cash? And, you know, we have phone and customer support. You know, this gnawing feeling, well, what if I need to speak to someone? And and in-app chat or email just didn't feel good enough. We saw very early, that was such a critical moment in the decision-making journey for them saying like, is there a voice? Could I ever talk to someone if I needed? Just offering, you know, good, sophisticated people who on the other side of the line who can help you out was game-changing. So that's that, that first part. And the second mm-hmm. one is actually widening or broadening their understanding of what a bank account can do for your business. You know, so many of them had long kind of thought, this is like, a, it's an outlet in the wall. I plug in, I get my electricity. I don't really care ultimately who the utility is. I just, as long as it works when I need it. And for them, their bank account had played that role. I got to have it. And I guess they're all interchangeable. So, you know, sign me up. When we start broadening the proposition saying we can be doing far more than just storing your money, it opens up almost like a part of, of their mind, something that they never even thought was possible. And that's actually, to me, the magical part, which is, you know, a whole other part of the value proposition of North One. I mean, you obviously, you have a digital bank account. What are the other pieces? What are the add-ons that people really want? So you, you start with, you know, this, what I call operational transactional banking, right? Get everything done. Your business can, can move, store money, et cetera. But then you just think of like layer one. So this is, you know, one of the first things we heard from customers was saying, you know, it is really intimidating to me to look at a balance number and get a sense from that, is my business healthy or not? Many of them don't even use accounting software or they get it, you know, their accounting updated every quarter. So it gives a terrible situation when they're spending blind. And so we started building with them a system called envelopes, where they can actually think of their bank account as an omnibus account and then create little sequester money for different purpose-driven reasons alongside. And all of a sudden it starts removing this fuzziness around what actual money do I have that I can spend because you create a tax sub envelope and you can move algorithmically 15% of all revenues get dropped in your tax account. And then you save up for your rent every month. Every week we take a quarter of the rent and we push it into the rent account. And all of a sudden it starts giving you a truer sense of what actual money you have to spend or not. That's just one example of how we are taking this raw problem that exists outside of banking. It's actually in the financial back office of the business where they're feeling you know blind to what's actually going on and trying to use the vessel of a bank account and a bank platform to start solving and that's just one example and there's, there's many many more but it's a flavor of the software layer that we built around banking which is i think you know so interesting to these businesses because they're typically not offered anything close to this by their banks for sure but even in the market you know much of this is geared towards enterprise or at least mis- mark- mid-market companies right right and the reality is obviously there's more of the small businesses than there are any other any other type of businesses but it strikes me like this could be a plumber, it could be a restaurant, it could be a dry cleaner. There's a huge variety of, of types of businesses. How do you reach these people? What do you do to bring them on board? It's such a foundational question to the even, you know, the, the should I should you even exist certain mm-hmm. segment? Um, we don't have a sales force, we don't have account managers, you know, it it is a self-serve, fully inbound model where we have a very sophisticated team inside, which you know uses a quantitative approach to you know demand generation and lead generation. But then in the funnel, the whole thing is self-serve and happens in minutes. And so the the reason that you can actually start serving tens of thousands of these smaller businesses without actually having negative economics is by having made it such a light touch approach to onboarding, to finding them, to onboarding them, and to getting them up and running. You can actually make some money on it, and you know, we we know that you know from the time they sign up to getting you know them using the account transactionally, it takes us less than a week to get them like signed up, 
approved in minutes and then starting to move all their banking and their, their money over, they're already using it to transact regularly within a week of signing up. And that's one of the examples of how if you make that vacuum really work and sucks them through the process and makes it meaningful to them, they start using it very, very quickly. Right, right. So we had Brex famously exited the small business market. They say they couldn't justify the economics. They're really focusing more on fast-growing startups or enterprise companies. Two-part question, what are the revenue generators for you and how can you profitably serve this market? Both sides of the equation, it's the revenue and the cost base. On the revenue side, you know, our customers pay us $10 a month on Netflix style banking, right? Do whatever you need, it's 10 bucks a month, it's not gonna go up or down, which did two really good things for us. On the one hand, it gives us some sort of a buffer against the variability of interchange as a revenue driver. But the other thing is that it's almost a bat signal to businesses where if you're a real business that is, you know, has real operations, you're like $10 a month, I I could care less, right? I'm I'm talking about moving 100,000, a quarter million dollars a month. If you can solve the problem, I'll happily pay 10. In fact, we have a lot of customers that say, if you solve this for me, like you say, well, I'll pay 10 times as much as you're asking for. Just get me, like, get this out of my (laughs) hair. But it also helps other businesses understand we might not be the right fit for them. You know, if you're if you're just making fifty dollars a week or a month on on Etsy because you you have an interesting passion hobby, there are other places you can get a fully free minimal use account, and and that's great. Like that's a nice part of the market. So what it has done is it allowed us to get a highly engaged cohort of real you know meaningful businesses that don't find us for the cost reason. They see the value side right. of the equation. Right but on the revenue generation piece, you know we have. Of course, you know, classic fintech interchange, but we have the subscription piece and a couple of other, you know, other elements to it, which helps create a meaningful revenue side of the equation. And on the cost side, what we do is we, we don't have that sales force, you know, people who are, you know, knocking on doors, making calls, et cetera. That whole part for us doesn't exist, nor does the branch network, obviously. But we've used technology as so many others have to kind of completely automate as much of the onboarding process, compliance, fraud process everything we can do to make it programmatic. And then we have a team of very sophisticated professionals on the support and on the compliance side who deal with the hardest cases that we get, the ones that don't really get solved easily by software. But but that's actually where you do want human eyes to kind of really dig into there and understand what's going on in, in whatever problem set they have. And, and that's allowed us to stay really agile on, on the business model side. Right, right. And I read somewhere that you... Last year, you were you're fairly early on, actually, in the elimination of overdraft and NSF fees. Did you miss that income or how did that impact you guys? Yeah, we're so happy to not have that. So for, we never even had it as income. We would actually just pass on whatever we had to kind of... Right, okay. That for. It was such a losing proposition when so many customers, the moment that they least needed to get dinged with you know a 20-something dollar charge, all of a sudden find that they're even, you know, more in the hole. And so just removing that whole that whole part of the equation felt philosophically right, but also just generated a whole bunch of customer goodwill. I mean, it's becoming more commonplace then, but now, but but at the time, we really wanted to take this step and say like, you know, you can come to us and not have to worry about that problem which you face in your other banks. And and it's real for especially in COVID, it was a real big thing for these businesses which couldn't predict what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Very often good businesses were hitting rock bottom for you know a month or two and then things were picking up again. Not having those kind of charges was a big big help for them. Right, right. So I want to talk about your bank partner, the Bank Corp Bank, which obviously is a partner for many fintechs. It's there on your on your website as being you know your partner bank. Tell us a little bit about that relationship and the importance of really having a good bank partner. I mean, they've been great. What what is not always clear to a lot of people walking into the fintech space for the first time is that so much of fintech relies on infrastructure that is banks. That is, you know, the very thing that fintech was trying to at the very, let's say we can do a better version of. But what's so special about the Bancorp model is that in many ways, their model is built to support our model, as opposed right. to, you know, I have a classic bank and there's a kind of this oddity idea that we have, we're going to bolt a fintech model onto the side of it and try to serve a couple of them. At one point, it does create important tensions amongst, you know, internally in that bank where someone's like, well, how are you making our money? And, you know, who's going to get prioritized? We're here. Their whole model is aligned around empowering us and other, you know, fintech customers are there to grow and to be successful. And I think the 
the importance of it is that we co-author a lot of our, our things together. You know, we work hand in hand on everything that comes to compliance, on everything that comes to kind of business model characteristics to make sure that we are always mutually comfortable with, you know, the way that we're proceeding. And we kind of need to have that same, you know, level of trust. But, you know, they're they're actually very progressive. They understand the world through my eyes, which is really helpful when we're talking to each other. It's not always the case. Right, right. Got it. So I want to talk about open banking for a second because Plaid has made it fairly um, commonplace to share your bank credentials and the whole kind of willingness of consumers to share their bank data. How is that on the small business side and how important is the whole concept of open banking to what you guys are doing? As a concept, it's foundational. As I started my journey, I actually saw the emergence of fintech in Europe, right? So my, my first experience here was watching this kind of movement of open banking in the UK and, you know, in Germany and seeing the way that changed everything. And so, you know, right at the core of, of, of North One, for example, is this foundational understanding that all this data is meant to be shared some, at some point. Mm-hmm. We've built all the doors, all the bridges that are ready. And you just have to find you know, the counterparty to kind of walk through that bridge with you. But the, the real value of open banking as a concept was how do we take all this information that's coming from all these sources, your Shopify account, your square point of sale, your suppliers, and use that, connect that whole piece around the data layer of the ledger, which is kind of the central repo of all comings and goings of your finance department. And so open banking, you can't, you can't even complete that sentence without the ideas of open banking you know, right. being foundational. The Plaid piece, for example, has an enormous amount of work in bringing the taste of what open banking is across America when it wasn't coming from the bank system itself or the government. Mm-hmm. Part of what we're doing is, is a bit changing the equation where our customers from their North One account can actually see into other places. They can actually connect to other tools from North One as opposed to having to go to all these other tools and then, you know, connect them one at a time back to that, to the bank account. And so it really allows us to be the central node that is designed to kind of work with Plaid and all these other services to just connect all these silos of data around your bank data. And that's, I think, the massive insight they get. Can you give us some examples of the, like, I mean, obviously you're talking accounting data, you're talking like there's Shopify with e-commerce. Who do you connect to? I mean, we connect to a whole host of third parties, right? And I think in many ways, we use our customers to tell us who, who to connect to next. Right. We just look statistically, you know, where where is counterparty deposits coming from or where are they sending money to and how do we enrich the experience of doing so? And so at the basic level, it's simply, can you make these transactions be English? Can you make them <laughs> not be garbage? And it sounds crazy, but there's a huge amount of, of, of folks working simply on making your transaction feel actually speak to you. Right. And then it gets into, you know, so what are the deposits that are currently waiting to be sent to you in your Shopify account or your square point of sale? Every one of these is a source of insight on what your business is, your business's financial health. But if you look at any one of them independently, none of them would know that you have all these other assets and kind of receivables coming in, vice versa. Whenever we see invoices coming through, you now can see the payable schedule. And so every one of these data points that is relevant to the business, we're trying to get as many of them as possible to start connecting. And then we can do the math and net out, okay, do you have enough money to pay your bills? Do you have, you know, how much money should you be receiving over the next seven days? And, and these are all really important parts of the value proposition. I think there's just, we're in the bottom of the first inning on this stuff. There's so much more that you can do once you start getting these foundational blocks in place. You said you don't have a sales team. But it sounds like you've probably gone deep in engineering, um, software engineering for your team. Give us some sense of the scale you guys are at. Like how many businesses, how big's the team, that sort of thing. You know, our team, we're, we're right now, I think about 70 or so total. It's a team that's now mostly distributed. Right. Um, you know, people have moved outside of big cities and they're still the best talent that we have. And so we've kind of adjusted our model. We have engineers and, and folks, especially around the country. And what that's done for us in such a nice way is now they're nested in the communities, uh, diverse communities that we serve small, small businesses in. So they can walk to our customers, you know, like they can actually see them in action. And that's what's so incredible about the diversity of a distributed model. There's, there's obviously challenges that come with it, but that team, we found that they can actually go see the coffee shop that they know could be a North One customer. So it's, it's really nice um, to have that. You have a New York City address, right? So so there's people in New York in your team? If you were to map it out, we have a, a cluster in New York, cluster in San Francisco, and a cluster in Toronto. Right. 
And then you have people really distributed in so many places. And we try to say, look, when we do in team events, uh, you come to the nearest cluster or we find a neutral city where nobody's there. And we try to, you know, bring people together to, you know, to create some diversity. But that's actually been um, really powerful. It's actually been pretty game changing to have not only be able to hire the best wherever they are, but also to actually have people coming from the communities that you're then looking to serve. You know, our right. customers classically are on Main Street, not, you know, on Sand Hill Road or on Wall Street. They're really embedded into local communities across the country. And there's a, just a different world sometimes that you have to then go experience and really truly understand why are they making choices like this and why are they asking us for these things? Once you truly put yourself in their shoes as an engineer, not just as a you know marketer, but as an engineer, you're actually able to solve their problems in a really interesting way. I'll give you one, one example, Peter. We had an mm -hmm. event in Atlanta, I think two weeks ago, an educational series. And we brought together a couple of, of groups that we partner with, um, Black Connect, Profit First, and, and created a, an educational you know, night. And so we sent some of the folks from our team to go and meet small business owners. Some of them were our customers, some of them were not. But just to see the way that you, you know, if you're an engineer or growth manager or, or even, you know, customer care and a compliance officer, seeing these people and actually being able to understand the rhythm of how they're thinking about their business was just, it, it opens up your, your mind in a way that a white paper or, you know, analytics just, just couldn't. That's great. That's great. So curious about your thoughts around a banking license. You obviously you said you have a great partnership and the bank called Bank's really popular. I've got a lot of fintechs that work with them. But is this something that's on your product roadmap? Where are you at when it comes to getting your own banking license? I'm really happy that I have people who <laughs> we work with the folks at the bank or who have made a living and being really good at that. It's it's just such a different DNA from what we're used to mm -hmm. that that it's it's actually really helpful to be able to leverage them for the foreseeable future and saying look, you know the regulators, you know the, the world of FDIC and, and, and OCC and deposit. Let us do the, the, the technology. We work with you on compliance, et cetera. But adding that other layer, it, it just, it's such a, it's such an apples and oranges equation. It's, it doesn't, I don't spend much time at night thinking about that part of it. There's so many other right. more practical problems that I want to solve. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I want to talk about fundraising because you recently announced a $67 million Series B, if I'm not mistaken. And this is not an easy market to raise money in. And you haven't seen many rounds, even you know, even over 50 million for months, it seems. But what was the process like and how did you kind of, and I presume it wasn't like you raised it nine months ago and you just announced it. Tell us a little bit about the process. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the process was very tied to the people that we were doing it with, right? I mean, it was when we finally found the right investor, a lot of the insanity of trying to fundraise at that time started melting away because you could see their conviction and we felt that these were the right partners and our existing investor base also saw that. And so it quickly kind of found itself together. But the crazy thing that I found was that the, the world was shifting while I was fundraising. You know, right. if you would ask me two, three years ago, so how, like, what's the strike zone? How do you speak the language of an investor? You're really thinking about things like how fast are you growing? You know, in, in the neobank space, it was often, you know, he or she who has the most accounts wins, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to be, you know, capture the market. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it was a focus on, could you really scale to, you know, to the full entirety of your vision? And, I, and that was the world we came from. And it, in real time, as I was having investor, con I could see where just the body language of where you were getting a really good engagement when you talk about margins and unit economics. And, you know, I didn't know what was like, I couldn't read where this whole thing was going, but I could certainly tell that people stopped caring about how big your revenue had grown over the last year. They wanted to know how profitable was it becoming while you're doing that. And as soon as we unlocked that, I probably revised my pitch deck maybe 10 to 15 times over the course of a few <laughs> months. Because like, you know, you're feeling like it's like, this is a tough crap. Why am I not resonating? And then you start realizing, ah, because I'm talking about the wrong part of the story and everything else is like a yes end. And the real thing they're waiting for is to say, how are you actually going to make money? And how are you actually, how are your unit economics stacking up? Get me that first. And then I'll care about whether you're growing 3X, 4X, 5X after. And just even realizing these subtleties allowed you to front load the thing that really got attention. And then in the long tail of your conversations, get to all the other important parts of the business, which is, hey, we actually can grow very quickly. We're good at it. Uh, our customers are, are you know, strong product market fit. That all came, you know, 
you have to refigure out the order and the way in which you spoke about the business. And so it was a real challenge. But the the other part of it was the fear. You know, you're you're seeing you're there. Sometimes when you're fundraising, you know that there's a cohort of other founders doing it at the same time. You kind of sometimes you bump into each other at an office, other right. times, like, you know, or writing saying, Hey, they're fundraising. Can you intro them to this person? And you start seeing people just getting, you know, dropping like the term she got pulled over there, this person, the terms became terrible and they were, you know, they're not sure if they can accept this round anymore. So you're watching this happen. And that's really where it came to who are you dealing with? You know, was, was the people on the other side of the table for us, were they, you know, were they going to hold the line? And they did, you know, and they, we had some terrific partners and we had strong conviction from previous investors who came in again and said, no, we, we get it. We're, we're kind of coming in strong to make sure that, that we support you. And all those worked in our favor. Almost, I'm certainly a lot of good luck at that right. at the same time. Right. Where are you on that pathway towards profitability? It's always been uh, an important part of the equation, but now it is like the most important part <laughs> right. of the equation as you start, you know, waiting what you're solving for. And so it is a absolute organizational priority to have line of sight to when we are, you know, OPEX break even, cash flow break even, and those things. I mean, we're trying to look at a future that is within our grasp where that actually happens. You know, and classically, if you talk to someone you know, three, four years ago, you're like, oh, well, you take seven years, 10 years, and that, that can work. But we saw a lot of people who've done that successfully. But you, you read, you got to read the crowd, you got to read the, the economic climate that we're in. And you're like, that's just not the, the situation we find ourselves. And so the chessboard, you, you're playing checkers and you're saying, let's front load all this work we were going to do on getting to a fully profitable break-even business early and then get to the other parts of it after. It's something that's going to be, you know, the next few years, hopefully. Right, right. Okay. So last question then, what are you excited about for next year as we look to 2023? What uh, what gets you going when you wake up in the morning? Three things. First is just the the incredible team that we put together that is, you know, I'd say in many ways war tested. You know, this is not the first time that they're seeing things melt around in the economy. And so they're just bringing back the war paint and kind of getting ready and, and going back right back in. So there's just this level of, you know, you look at you look to your left, you look to your right, and you know that you have people who can go the distance. The second part is the customers and, and tracking. I mean, I, I really enjoy understanding the tracking needs, especially the volatility of what our customers are facing. How do we then say, well, what are you going to need in the next few months? Like, how do we actually get that to you before it's too late? And so just watching the resilience of our customers and then helping elucidate the product roadmap that should come out of, of you know, where the puck is heading. That's the third one. I think the last the last piece of it is, I think it'll be some time before the world changes back again. And so really thinking about this new environment that we're in, you know, likely recession, dramatic changes in the venture space. And how do we use this moment to truly change the way that every part of the business runs DNA of the people, the way we think about it. It's just like you got a new game and you're reading the chess, you know, the new instructions of the game, and you're thinking there's so many possibilities on how we can re evolve in this context. And those are really, really exciting parts of the puzzle right now. Mm -hmm. Well, hey Tam, we'll have to leave it there. It's very got a, a great business doing a great service for the the small businesses, of which you know I am one. I'm a lifetime small business owner. My father was before me. So got a soft spot for anyone who was trying to address that problem. So Thanks a lot for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. You know, like Atan, I grew up in a, a family that was really centered around a small business that my father owned. And I'm I'm struck, you know, in the in my childhood in the 70s and 80s, I would see my dad and I ended up joining the family business. So I got to see it firsthand. But there was so much done. Everything was done manually for a start. All the financial stuff was done on literally on paper ledgers that my, my father would spend time on. And I, I think about the amount of effort that it took to run the finances of that business. And my dad was an accountant. He understood finances very, very well. And I think about the amount of time, and it's probably, I don't know, a quarter, a third of his time was spent just on this administrative task of running the business. And that is where today is so different. And I think with offerings like what North One are doing, rather than spending 25, 30% of your time on the administrative financial tasks of running a business, maybe that could be two or 3% of your time. And then suddenly you've got all this extra time fo that you can do now to focus on building the business. That is so different than what it was like before. And I feel, you know, there's never been a better time to start a small business because the tools that are available today have never been better. 
And the good news is they're only going to improve. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.